Hey folks, I'll not beat around the bush here if you're shopping for a graphics card in early 2020, aiming for 1080p and want to stay well below 3 figures, absolutely nothing touches the Radeon RX 570. 60-class Pascal cards are priced way too high on the used market, the GTX 1050 Ti simply can't hold a candle to this cutback Polaris card, and due to scarcity, older cards like the GTX 960, R9 380X and even stalwarts of the budget realm like the HD 7970 are now simply not price competitive with what the RX 570 can offer. Here in the UK a couple of weeks back, there was a seller selling hundreds of these cards, manufacture refurbished for not just under 100 quid, but under 60. Even today, with the increase in price from that particular seller, you can still easily nab one of these for under £65. So today we're going to be taking a little look at these lower end, cheaper 4GB RX 570s. And I'm going to discuss what you can expect in terms of performance, and also how you can get the most out of it. If you're not familiar with the 570 and 580 cars from AMD, all you really need to know is that the 570 uses the same silicon as the 580, but has a few cutbacks. Basically, if a GPU doesn't pass the mustard as being suitable to match the reference spec of a 580, it gets a shot at redemption with a chance of becoming a 570. This means that the core configuration is cut down for starters, the 570 features 2048 shader units across 32 compute units, while the fully enabled GPU in the 580 features 36 CUs given 2304 shaders. There is a slight reduction in texture mapping units due to the reduction in CUs, but the 570 does keep the same 32 ROPs as the RX 580, and also uses the same 256-bit memory bus. Clocks are lower than the 582, with the reference spec for the 570 being around 100 MHz or so lower, at 1244 MHz. The official specification for memory speed is 1750 MHz, which when we multiply that figure by 4, gives us an effective speed of 7000 MHz, or 7 gigabit per second. There are a few cards out there, this ITX version from Sapphire being one of them, that actually shipped with memory speeds of only 6 gigabit per second, or 1500 MHz, which reduces the memory bandwidth to 192 gigabytes per second, which is the same as you're going to get in something like a GTX 1066 gig, or the GTX 1650. Super. Speaking of this ITX Pulse RX 570, it features a single 6-pin PCIe power connector, and in standard setup, is tuned with a TDP of only 120 watts, despite the board being able to take 150. This is obviously geared towards smaller form factor builds with less thermal headroom, but it does mean that we've got a bit of room to push the performance envelope up a good bit. I'm going to release a separate tuning guide for this card, as it's so much fun to tinker with. But the headline figure for this video is that after some power tuning and undervolting, the card's stock boost clock of 1244 MHz was upped to 1350, and the memory speed was increased from 6 gigabit per second to 7.6, which translates to a 27% increase in memory bandwidth, up from 192 gigabytes per second to 243 which is most definitely noticeable. So specs out of the way, how does all this translate to in-game performance? Well, to give you an idea, let's compare it to AMD's latest budget offering, the RX 5500 XT 4GB, which will cost about 180 quid new, and an RX 588GB, which is going to cost about the same new, or around 120 quid used. The PC I'm using for this is the typical budget build featured in the last video, which features a first gen Ryzen CPU and 16 gigs of DDR4. Now we'll kick things off with Shadow of the Tomb Raider on medium at 1080p, and here the newer Navi architecture flexes its muscles a little, returning a small but measurable gain over the RX 580, while the stock 570 trails by around 25%. With an overclock in place though, that deficit is almost halved with the RX 570 gaining about 10% over its baseline configuration. Cranking the settings up to high, well, that kind of wipes the smile from the face of the 5500 XT, with the RX 580 storming ahead. There is still a gap of around 10% between the stock 4GB 570 and the 4GB 5500 XT, but when the overclock is applied, the 570 pulls neck and neck with the newer Navi-based card, being a solitary frame slower on average, but returning slightly better 1% lows. Rise of the Tomb Raider and the 5500 XT and the 580 are pretty much neck and neck here. As in the newer title, the 570 trails the pack in stock form, 
but here it returns an experience with minimums well over 60 FPS. When overclocked, the 4GIG 570 it closes the gap on the pack leader to within 7% of the averages and only a few FPS down on the percentile lows. At this stage, there's nigh on zero perceptible difference between using any of the cards. World War Z on the high preset is a title which really, really likes Polaris based cards and isn't so fond of Navi as we've seen in my 5500 XT review. Whereas in the first benchmark, the 570 in stock form trailed the 5500 XT by around 25%, in a Polaris optimised title which favours more compute cores, the gap between the two cards is absolutely nothing. Obviously, our overclock pushes the figures even further, with the RX 570 starting to close the gap on the 580. There's still around a 10% difference between those two, but it is a mighty impressive result for a sub 60 quid card. Far Cry New Dawn had the 580 and the 5500 XT neck and neck when I last looked at it, and when using the 570, we do see a noticeable gap in stock form. It closes up a little when overclocked, but really, you will be wanting to reduce a setting or two to bring those 1% lows up to 60 FPS, unless of course you're running an adaptive sync monitor. But it does show that in some titles, there is a bit of a difference between the 580 and 5500 XT level cards and the 570. That said though, having a look at the aggregate results in all of these tests helps paint a picture that's a little bit clearer. In stock form, this single fan, 60 quid, 4 gig 570, trailed the 580 by around 19% on average, with the gap between the 4 gig 570 and the 4 gig 5500 XT being a more modest 12%. It really cannot be understated though how much the overclocked help things out. And the thing is though, my overclock at 1350 on the boost and 7.6 gigabit per second memory speed isn't even that impressive. ASRock's Phantom Gaming X, RX 570 for example, ships with memory speeds of 8.2 gigabit per second out of the box, and Sapphire's own Nitro version of the 570 ships with a boost clock of 1340 megahertz, again out of the box. And when these kind of speeds are in play, the performance on offer from the RX 570 is within a few percent or a couple of frames of the 4GB RX 5500 XT. So what I ended up with my card was the same performance as the 5500 XT at a third of the price. Now when I started this channel, my advice to anyone wanting a budget GPU back then was to look at the RX 470. Forget the 1050 Ti or a GTX 960 the cut down Polaris card was the king. And you know what, three years on, it's still the same story. Forget the small Turing cards, forget about power and Pascal cards on the used market, and really, you can probably forget about the baby Navi cards too for the time being. The card I've tested here is really bottom of the barrel stuff when it comes to stock performance. There ain't too many 570s that ship with 6 gigabit per second memory configurations. And that has a huge impact on overall performance. Most AIB models will ship with 7 gigabit per second memory, and clock speeds much closer to my OC levels than the stock figures. So just do yourself a favour. If you need a cheap graphics card, get one of these before the Polaris stock dries up. But I'm going to leave it there for today. I would love to know what you think of ye olde Polaris. Is there anything that comes close to the value on offer where you live? Have you recently picked one up on the cheap? And is it a card that's on your radar? As always though, I'll just say thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the comments section down below, and in the next video.